All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our latest BCBA mock exam. This is exam number six, and we're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, when you pass, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. 107. After a lengthy differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors intervention, Max is no longer banging on his parents' door in the middle of the night. Instead, Max received $1 each time he stayed in bed until 6 a.m. Recently, Max's parents have been busy and are forgetting to give Max the $1. Now, Max is back to banging on the door. What does this most resemble? A few different things happening in this question. First, what is the question asking us? We're looking at what's occurred in Max's behavior and what that resembles relative to what was going on before. So let's break it down. First, we used a differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors intervention, meaning we've replaced Max's banging on the door in the middle of the night with a different behavior, an alternative behavior, which was staying in bed until 6 a.m. Now, a mistake here where would be someone would try to argue with the type of intervention we used. That's not important, right? That's just what the question is saying was used. We need to answer the question asked, which is why did Max start banging on the door again? So don't argue and fight with the question. Just answer the question using the information given. So instead of banging on the parent's door, Max stayed in bed until 6 a.m. And each time he did, he got $1, which was his reinforcement. Now, Max's parents have been busy and aren't giving Max the $1. So what's occurred here? Well, previously, they put the banging on the parents' door on extinction, and then they were reinforcing staying in bed until 6, 6 a.m., the differential reinforcement procedure. Now, Max is no longer getting the $1. So staying in bed is now not getting reinforcement. Reinforcement is being withheld. That behavior is now on extinction as well. So now all the behaviors are on extinction. As a result, Max is back to banging on the door. So what does that resemble? A, resurgence. Resurgence is very similar to spontaneous recovery when we're talking about extinction, except resurgence is exactly what's described in this scenario. When the new behavior that replaced the old behavior is put on extinction, and then the other behavior returns, that's resurgence. The difference between spontaneous recovery is with spontaneous recovery, the extinct behavior reoccurs out of nowhere. With resurgence, there's actually a reason you can point to. In this case, the new behavior was put on extinction, causing the old behavior to come back. An extinction burst happens prior to the behavior being extinguished, and we're already past the extinction phase. And then resistance to extinction, same with extinction burst, it happens during the extinction process. We're already past that. Max had a replacement behavior. Unfortunately, his parents got busy, stopped reinforcing it, started putting it on extinction, even inadvertently. Now the old behavior is back. What does that resemble? A, resurgence. 108, Chef Leon received several mediocre reviews from food critics last week regarding his new short rib special. Chef Leon invited the reviewers back to try the dish again and asked that they resubmit their reviews. This time, Chef Leon added ginger to the broth, and the reviews all came back positive. You might consider the ginger a blank relative to the reviews being the blank. All right, so kind of a two-parter here, right? We're looking at what the question is considering the ginger relative to the reviews. Now, we never jump ahead to our answer choices, but you're more than likely to quickly glance, and it's going to give you an idea of what we're looking for. And so clearly here, we're looking for what kind of variables are we talking about? What is the ginger? What are the reviews? Now, independent variables, independent variables. We have to know these, right? We just put out our video, our task list series video on IVs and DVs. So go watch that if you're still having trouble. The independent variable is what you're manipulating, what you're adding, what you're taking away, what you're changing in the environment. The dependent variable is the behavior that you're targeting or that is affected by the IV. Now, a confound is something we're not controlling that is affecting the DV. In this case, though, there are no confounds, right? Because we, we control the ginger, okay? And then we, we're looking at the reviews. So we have to ask ourselves, which one is the IV and which one is the DV? Well, in this case, 
Chef Leon received bad reviews from food critics. He invited them back to review it again. This time, what did Chef Leon change? Well, he added ginger. So he's manipulating the ginger. He's adding it to the environment, making it an IV. As a result, the reviews changed, right? The reviews changed dependent on the IV, making it the dependent variable. So the ginger would be an independent variable. The reviews would be a dependent variable. The dependent variable is dependent on the IV. And when our dependent variable changes reliably and predictably due to our manipulations, that's called functional or experimental control. So you would or you might consider the ginger an independent variable since you're controlling it relative to the reviews being the dependent variable because they are changing or dependent on the IV. 109, a dietitian is using hypnosis to change the thought patterns of one of her clients. She places several food and drink items in front of the client and tells the client to point to the items that contain unhealthy amounts of sugar. The client scans the item and points at a Kit Kart bar and a can of Dr. Pepper. What type of stimuli in a stimulus class would the Kit Kat and Dr. Pepper be considered? This is actually a pretty straightforward question, which is longer, right? So don't be intimidated by the length of the question. What are we answering? We're, ask, we're answering, what type of stimuli are the Kit Kat and Dr. Pepper in a stimulus class? So in a stimulus class, our stimuli can have different properties, and stimuli can have multiple properties. Now, let's go through it. We have a dietitian. She's changing the thought patterns of her clients. She puts these items in front of the client. Tells the client to point to the items that contain unhealthy amounts of sugar. What does it do? What does, it, what does the client do? They scan the items and they point at the Kit Kat bar and the can of Dr. Pepper. So the Kit Kat bar and Dr. Pepper are both evoking the same response, right? So it seems like they're part of a stimulus class. Now, are the Kit Kat and Dr. Pepper an arbitrary stimulus class or stimuli? They are, right? Because they don't share characteristics. Arbitrary stimuli don't share a similar form, right? A can of Dr. Pepper and a Kit Kat bar are very distinct. Yeah, you could maybe argue colors are similar, but that's about it, right? They're very arbitrary, yet they're evoking the same response. So are they a functional stimulus class? They are, because they're evoking the same response, right? They're, they're, they're the function of these stimuli, stimuli are the same. They're evoking the pointing. And then temporal. Temporal is relative to the response, right, or relative to the ABC contingency, well, the Kit Kat bar and Dr. Pepper both evoke the response of pointing, right? And so they are both temporally related similarly to the pointing. So the Kit Kat bar and Dr. Pepper are arbitrary because they don't share similar characteristics. They're temporal because they both occur at the same time in that contingency. And they're both functionally similar because they're evoking the same response. They're evoking similar functional responses. So what type of stimuli in a stimulus class would the Kit Kat and Dr. Pepper be considered? Well, D, all the above. 110, experimental control is closely tied with what dimension of applied behavior analysis? Okay, short, simple question. When you get an easy question, what do we do? We trust our preparation. We answer it. We don't overthink it. We move on. All right, so experimental control. What is experimental control? It's when we have predictable, reliable control over what our dependent variable does, meaning our manipulations of the environment are changing the behavior, and we can repeat that and reliably repeat that over and again, over and over again, right? And so experimental control is tied with what dimension of ABA? A, applied. Applied says we're looking for socially valid change, right? We want to target socially valid things, meaningful things. You can have experimental control over the most meaningless things in the world, right? So experimental control is not necessarily tied with applied. What about B, analytic? Well, analytic says we want to establish a functional relationship. So experimental control is very closely tied with the analytic dimension. We want to have control over the behavior due to what we're manipulating in the environment. Behavioral just says we are looking for observable, measurable behaviors. Again, experimental control is somewhat tied to probably all of these, but it's most closely tied to analytic. And then effective, meaning we are effectively making change to a, a meaningful extent. 
So you can have experimental control to an to a irrelevant extent, right? Uh, we want to we want all our change to be effective, meaning it's 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 legitimate change that is actually leading to life changes, right? It's changes in the person's life. Uh, that's what effective is saying. And again, experimental control to be effective, you need some you need experimental control, right? But we need the best answer. So the best one and what it's most closely tied to is analytic. This is what makes dimension questions so hard is they're so tied together, all seven of them, that it's very easy to misconstrue each one. So you've got to read very carefully and you've got to keep in mind, I need the best possible answer. And the most closely tied dimension to experimental control is analytic. 111. Eleven. Jaden, after exhausting every other strategy, introduces a response cost procedure targeting hair pulling. Jaden's behavior technician reports that the response cost was effective during the first hour of session, but hair pulling only occurred twice in total. Can Jaden claim experimental control? Another experimental control question. Let's continue the theme, right? So we're looking at Jaden, all right, and he wants to know, or she wants to know, do does do they have experimental control? So they've introduced this response cost. Targeting hair pulling, okay? And so Jaden's behavior technician reports that, hey, response cost was effective, but only during the first hour of session. Now, what is one of the standards for experimental control? One of the standards for experimental control is we must see it happen over and over and over and over again to reliably say we have experimental control. And it's almost impossible to claim 100% experimental control. There are just too many variables in the environment, right? So unless you're in a white-walled room where you have total control over what's happening, claiming 100% experimental control is diff difficult. There's too many variables, especially if you've only watched behavior happen twice in a single hour. Maybe response cost was effective the first two times, but maybe something else was going on in that hour. So JD can say, well, it seems like it's effective. We might start to have experimental control, but claiming experimental control already seems a bit premature. So A, yes, Jaden's strategy is reliably controlling the behavior. We can't say that yet. The behavior only occurred twice. It's only been an hour. We just don't know yet. We don't have enough data. B, no, the strategy must effectively control the behavior repeatedly. Yes, that's what we're looking for. Twice in one hour, it's just not enough. You have to get more data to say, I have experimental control. That's why we do, and that's why we take data over and over again. The more data, the stronger our claim. See, yes, one time is enough to claim experimental control. Absolutely not. Plus, it occurred twice. D, no, you can never claim experimental control in this situation. Not true. If Jaden watches this response cost have a, an effect on hair pulling for a month, then you, then you can start to say, well, I have experimental control because I have um, so many data points indicating I have experimental control. Currently, I, I have two data points in one hour on the same same day. It's just not strong enough yet to claim experimental control. So can Jaden claim it? No, the strategy must effectively control the behavior repeatedly. 112, you're shopping for a house and land on one you like. Following the inspection, you tell the seller that you want to buy the house, but you need them to repair the roof first. What are you establishing? So what am I establishing here? What are you establishing here? And this is a pretty straightforward question, right? So you, you, you're shopping for a house. You pick one, you get it inspected, and so you tell the seller, all right, I'm going to buy the house, but first, you've got to repair the roof. So let's think about that in terms of maybe our clients. What does that sound like? Well, to me, it sounds like a if-then or first then. First you do this, then this happens. If you do this, then this happens. And what do we call that phrase? A, a bribe. So a bribe is not what we do. A bribe is the opposite of what we do, which is a contingency. A bribe is when the consequence is delivered first. A bribe in this case would be, okay, I bought the house, now you have to repair the roof. Or in your learner's case, okay, here's a lollipop, now you have to go behave. We never bribe. It's always contingent on something. So this is a contingency. I'll buy the house if you repair the roof first. So first you repair the roof, then I buy the house. For your learners, first you behave all day, then you get a lollipop. 
That's a contingency. We always establish contingencies. We don't know if we're establishing punishers or reinforcers. We're not really talking about punishing and reinforcing consequences of stimuli. All we're talking about here is establishing this first then contingency. And then 113, which of the following situations would likely be considered to represent empiricism the best? All right, empiricism question. What is empiricism? Empiricism says we observe behavior and make data-based decisions, right? Which is why we always have to do direct measurements and direct assessments before anything. We never rely solely on indirect assessments. We want to be empirical. We, 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 we are empirical when we actually observe the phenomenon and we use data based on observation to make decisions. So we're looking for the situation which is likely to be likely to represent empiricism the best, likely to be considered to represent empiricism the best. So which situation is the most empirical? A, Justin and John are watching the Cowboys. Justin hates the Cowboys. So after a Cowboy makes a good play, Justin says they stink. Is this empirical? Well, no, it's biased. Justin hates the Cowboys. So even when the Cowboy makes a good play, he watches the play. It's a good play. And still, he says they stink. That's bias. That is not empirical. Empirical would be Justin hates the Cowboys. But when the Cowboys make a good play, Justin says that was a good play. That's empirical. Empirical is objective. B, Lucy heard from her friend Lane that Liam was spreading rumors about her behind her back. Lucy heard. Lucy didn't observe. Lucy didn't see data. Lucy heard. Not very empirical. C, every morning, Randy watches two cardinals land in his bird feeder. He notices they eat most of the sunflower seeds based on his measurements, so he adds more to the feeder. This is extremely empirical, right? He's observing the cardinals land in the bird feeder. He's observing them eating the sunflower seeds, and he has measurements. Right, So he's observing, he's measuring, very, very empirical. And then D, Jason is suspended from school for hitting another student. His mom, who does not work at the school, tells the school they should do a better job of keeping Jason busy. I mean, how often does that happen? His mom, who is not present for any of this, is telling the school why it occurred and what they need to be doing. That is not very empirical. They don't mention data. They don't mention observation. That is not empirical. Empirical is observation. It's objective. We're looking at data. We are making decisions based on what's occurring and what we're observing. So what represents empiricism the best? Every morning, Randy watches two cardinals land in his bird feeder. He notices they eat most of the sunflower seeds based on his measurements, so he adds more to the feeder. Thank you for watching. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. Spread the word about ABA Exam Review for helping you out. We love word of mouth. We really appreciate it. Like, subscribe, and let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday. Shout out. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.